Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the earth. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Romans 15, 4 through 13. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you, for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the people extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that, the, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The second Sunday of Advent Gospel is Matthew 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wrote a, wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue our Advent pilgrimage, we pray that we would hear the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As Matthew recalled the ministry of John the Baptist, he reflected that that ministry was one that had been foretold, prophesied by Isaiah. And he quoted from Isaiah the words, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. In other words, as Matthew reflected on the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus that began with the baptism that Jesus underwent at the Jordan River, he takes us to the Jordan River and the ministry of John the Baptist and the fact that he understood, and the disciples understood, the first Christians understood, that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. That, uh, that John the Baptist was the voice crying in the wilderness. And that that voice was sent to prepare the way of the Lord. So our call today, our Advent call today is to hear that same message as we continue to prepare the way of the Lord. As we look at our texts today, then, we'll see that there are three things that happen in the process of this preparation. That there is first the call to repent that we see in the first verse of chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We also recognize that with repentance, there is forgiveness, that there is a purpose for repentance. As we look at what repentance is and why we need it, we'll see that the one who comes, comes with the purpose of forgiving. And then we will see that as repentance and forgiveness are combined in our hearts, in our lives, that there is a change in us, and that then we are called to bear fruit. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not words that we particularly like to hear. The temptation as we look at our gospel, is to look down on the Pharisees and the, Fad and the Sadducees, to think of ourselves as better than they. And yet the message of repentance came for them and for all, and the message of repentance comes also for us, and brings with it the recognition that we are indeed sinners that we are conceived and born, separated from God, that we have inherited from Adam and Eve this separation, this rebellion, this selfishness, this self-centeredness, 
This idea that we can be our own God and that we do not need another God to tell us what is right and wrong. And that we can make those decisions on our own. And what we find when we do that is that we do live a life of selfishness. And that we seek to please ourselves first. And this is sin. It is rebellion against God's ways, thinking that we can be God rather than submitting ourselves to the God who is, the God who created, the God who continues to create. The God who has proclaimed judgment against sin. And so we do recognize that we are sinners and in that, we need to fear the wrath of God. We see these words spoken to the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's verse 7 of Matthew 3. He calls them a brood of vipers, and that's the recognition, as we are called a brood of vipers, that we are indeed sinners. And then he asks them this question, Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then as he continues this conversation with them, he talks about the wrath to come. That every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Or in another metaphor, that the winnowing fork is used to separate the wheat from the chaff. And the chaff is burnt with unquenchable fire. The recognition that there is eternal consequence for our sin, for our rebellion. We call it the wrath of God because God is not happy about our rebellion. He is not happy about the brokenness that re results from our rebellion. He does not desire the death of anyone, but he does call us to repent, to recognize our sin, to confess our sin, to say, in a sense, that we're sorry. Not just to say it, though, but to mean it. And then, when we recognize our sin and fear the wrath of God, then we see that we do all indeed need to repent. From the Hebrew perspective, this is a physical act that we are traveling down the wrong mountain path and that we need to turn around and go the other direction. That we are living for ourselves and we need to recognize that living for ourselves is not the way to eternal life. And so we need to turn around and follow the way that God has designed for us. Or in the Greek sense, we need to have our minds renewed, or we need to change our minds, that we are thinking wrong, and that our wrong thinking leads to wrong behavior, that is, that our thoughts are all about ourselves, and about satisfying ourselves, and taking care of ourselves, and that that's the wrong mindset to have because that mindset will end in eternal separation from God. And so our minds need to be changed so that now we have the mind of Christ. So we are thinking the way God thinks and living the way God desires us to live. We need We also recognize that with repentance, when we repent, there is forgiveness. It's not something that we can earn. It is something that God gives to us freely and unconditionally. And we see that in our texts by the promise that He comes to us in order to fulfill this gift. We see it in Isaiah chapter 11, 
which was our Old Testament lesson. Verse 1 begins with, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So we have this kingly image, remembering that Jesse was the father of King David, and it is in the line of King David then that the shoot of the stump comes forth, the branch that bears fruit is Jesus. John the Baptist alludes to him also, points to him also, in verse 11 of our Gospel text, where he says, He who is coming after me is mightier than I. And so we are pointed then to the coming, to the coming of the King, the coming of the King, however, who comes to forgive, not to bear judgment, but to forgive. And we see that forgiveness, again, as we look at our Gospel text, as Matthew recorded the words of John the Baptist, speaking in that context to the Pharisees and Sadducees, speaking today to us, John said, I baptize you with water for repentance. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And we understand then from, uh, from the, the rest of Scripture, and particularly as we look at Romans chapter 6, that our baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire is a baptism that puts to death our old nature and brings to life the new. It is our participation, the way that God allows us to participate in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. So as John said he will baptize you, he was pointing us forward to the cross. Where Jesus died the death we deserve in our place, where Jesus took the punishment we deserve for our sin, where Jesus experienced the wrath of God and appeased the wrath of God for us, that we would be forgiven. And then we have the further metaphor, as John the Baptist is speaking here, that his winnowing fork is in his hand. So we're taken to the agricultural society of that day, in those days that John the Baptist came preaching. And the picture of the farmer with his winnowing fork, it's a fork particularly designed to pick up the grain that's been thrashed and as that grain is thrown into the air, the chaff is blown aside and the wheat falls. And the wheat is gathered into the barn. And this is a picture for us of what Jesus accomplishes for us in the forgiveness of our sin and the promise of fellowship with Him that begins now and will last for all eternity. So yes, we are called to repent. And as we repent to receive the gift of forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins, reconciliation, We notice also that there is a change that is expected when all of this happens. When the old nature is put to death, the new nature rises in its place, this change is real. And it has a real effect in how we live our lives. In our Gospel again, John the Baptist speaking again to the Pharisees and Sadducees, speaking to us, says to us 
that we are to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That means that when we repent and when we receive forgiveness, when our old nature is put to death and the new is raised, that how we live is different. And we see this bearing of fruit played out for us in our New Testament lesson, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. So Paul is remembering the Old Testament writings. We might say he's remembering the prophecies that were spoken. But more than that, all of what has been written for us in Scripture is for our instruction. Yes, to call us to repentance. Yes, to promise us forgiveness. And yes, to show us how to live, how to bear fruit. Again, verse 4, chapter 15, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. This is not a drudgery. Living the life that God designed for us is not hopeless. It's not a drudgery. It's a joy. When he says that we might have hope, he is looking forward to, again, that being gathered into the barn. The hope of eternity. The hope of the, the, the certain reality of God's presence in our lives now and the promise of that presence eternally. And that is why he has given us the scripture, to call us to repentance, to give us the promise of forgiveness, and to call us to bear fruit. And so then we look at verse 5, where we're picking up on the endurance and the encouragement, and there's a prayer here, Maybe a benediction, but a prayer made the God of endurance and encouragement. So the God who gives us endurance and encouragement through his word may that God grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. We'll get to the such, because it's for a purpose. But it's a call to live in harmony in Christ Jesus, in accord with Christ Jesus. So because we've been forgiven, because our old selfish nature has been put to death, and a new nature, selfless nature, has risen in its place, then we are called to live in harmony. And that means that we live in giving and not in taking. That we look for the good of the other rather than the good of the self. That we live in harmony because of what Christ has done for us and using him as our example perfect example of love, sacrificial giving of the self, that Jesus died sacrificially, giving himself in our place for us. And so we, in accord with Christ Jesus, are called then to live in harmony, not in selfishness, not fulfilling the desires of the flesh, but in giving, in selfless love. To live in such harmony, he said, verse 6 then takes us to why. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is where our bearing fruit ends. That as we live selfless lives, because we've been forgiven, Again, it's not in order to be forgiven, it's because we've been forgiven. We live in harmony, so that we, living together in harmony, may with one voice, that's a unity here, glorify 
the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Recognize Him to be God. Worship Him. Submit to Him. Do what pleases Him so that others might see our good works also and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Martin Chemnitz, the primary author of the Formula of Concord, bringing together the factions of Lutheranism after Luther's death, he's often called the second Martin, wrote this paraphrase, we might say, of John the Baptist's words to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And let's hear these words as words to us today. If your repentance is a serious turning away from sin, a true fear of the wrath of God, there will follow in the correcting of your life such fruits in avoiding sin and in the pursuit of works which please God, which are worthy of repentance, that is, which befit true repentance, and which make clear that you have come to your senses, that you hate sins, that you don't want to offend God, but want to serve Him. Father in heaven, we pray that we would indeed recognize our sin, humble ourselves before you, Receive your forgiveness as we repent. And then, because we have been transformed, live in the desire to serve you. We ask in Jesus' name.